County Board of Supervisors meeting, recorded September 17, 2024. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 25 supervisors present. <clears throat> Correspondence. Uh, Aging and Disability Resource Center of Portage County 2023 Annual Report. You'll find that in your packet. Uh, upcoming County Board and Finance Committee meeting dates and information related to the county budget. Also in your packet. Wisconsin Counties Association Forward Analytics, The Green Book, A Book of County Facts. You should all have a copy. Uh, in front of you, and uh, Office of Portage County Clerk out of county resolutions. Those should also be included in your packet. Presentations, uh, Cindy Petrowski, Aging and Disability Resource Center of Portage County Director. Cindy, would you like to come up? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for letting me present. I just want to mention a couple of things about this presentation. Um, <clears throat> normally about this time, I would have done one on our annual report in the agency, but after this presentation uh, was done at our aging advocacy training, my board members felt it was important for all of you to see this as well. And so we're going to talk about this and I want you to know where these slides came from before I start. These came from the Bureau of Aging and Disability Resources. They were put together by their demographer, Eric DeGrasso. So I did not do these slides myself. I got them from the Bureau of Aging and Disability Resources. So now I will share with you some of what we're looking at. So we've all, we've all heard multiple times that we are an aging society, right? And this map, and there's a couple others very similar to it in the packet, shows that Portage County is actually one of the younger counties in the state. Now, if you look at this, and this is from 2022, um, we're at about 25% of our population being 60 and older. You look at the Northwoods, you're going to see a whole lot more dark green. Um, <clears throat> but if you look, you could almost lay a map of the UW system <laughs> over this and um, see where the younger counties are with a couple of exceptions. But um, we are... Um, if you were to factor out the students, we would be aging um, similar to our neighbors, I believe. Oh. Do you have it on? It went. Believe it or not, right before we started, there we go. So this is the number of live births in Wisconsin over the last, I don't know, almost 100 years. And you will see from 1946 to 1964, that group called the Baby Boomers. Um, most of the people that I am serving currently are going to be either Baby Boomers or they're going to be in the silent generation, which is immediately preceding them. So the people that were very young or born during World War II. Then you have the boomers who are volume, and then you have the Gen X, and then millennials, and Gen Z is after that. And we're looking at the youngest of the boomers are 60 this year. So for the next 25 years, we are going to be looking at 
higher numbers of people 60 and older in Portage County. This slide is a state projection. So I have a bunch of state numbers and then we'll look more at Portage County. So in 2010, 60 and older was about 19% of the state population up to 25. And by 2040, we're looking at almost 30% of the total state population being 60 and older. This is a slide that I think um, tells the uh, biggest story. <laughs> so when you look at this, the bottom level is 60 to 69, kind of that gray blue. Red is 70 to 79. Green is 80 to 89. And that yellow is 90 and older. So when you look at the numbers from 2010, 42,000 people, almost 43, were at 90 and older. By 2040, that number is well over 100,000. We are living longer lives. When you look at 80 to 89, we're going to go from in 2020, 199,000, just under 200,000 at 80 to 89, to more than 452,000 throughout the state. Now, that's not necessarily going to bear out to those exact proportions here in Portage County because, again, we are a younger county because of the university. Um, lucky us, but we are still going to see a profound increase in the numbers of people who are 60 and older. And the reason I point out this 80 to 89 and 90 and older is because those are the age groups that are most likely to need additional services. Not everyone needs additional services. Most people are never going to end up in assisted living or a nursing home or any kind of facility. Most seniors, and if you ask them, this is what they tell you they want, are going to age in their homes, which is what they want. But these numbers are pretty startling. And when you see even the 70 to 79, it's more than doubled from 2010 to 2040. So in that 30 year, 30 year gap. So this is another state map where we're seeing more and more, you know, 2015, there's a few older counties, 2025, a few more, um, and then by 2035, these counties are a lot older, and we have a fair number of counties that are going to be at nearly 50% of the county being 60 and older which leads to its own set of issues going forward in terms of services, et cetera. 2040, same kind of thing going on. Now, eventually this trend does reverse itself, um, but we don't go out that far yet. <laughs> but you can see this is Portage County. This is 60 and older in Portage County from 2000 to 2023. We have almost doubled the number of people 60 and older in our own county in a 23 year period. Serving that many more people 
is going to present lots of challenges as we move forward. Now this is the 80 and older population. So this is Portage County for those 80 and older. And you see we're not hit quite as hard in the 80 and older category as the state was when you look at those other numbers. But we're still looking at increases. The decrease that you see from 2019 that goes across has been attributed to COVID. Composition by race and ethnicity of age group. <clears throat> so this is all ages and then ages 60 and older. So when you... I think you want to go back. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. Skipped ahead. Um, so the county is at 89.6% for white non-Hispanic. When we are talking about our seniors, we're at 96.6%. So we do not have a lot of diversity in our senior population. Um, Hispanic, it's very low. Asian, also relatively low. Uh, two or more races, even lower. Uh, Native American is very similar um, to the county as a whole, and um, black is also very low. Um, I will say this, we actually, when you look at um, somebody that said, oh, you're going to see a 40% increase in the number of African Americans in your county between now and 2040. You know, that takes us all the way up to 14. Um, <laughs> So, you know, you got to look at what are the actual numbers and not just the percentages. Then this is uh, one year changes in population by age group. Um, again, the zero to 59, that big dip um, is Again, Eric had told me this is related to COVID. And then it, we have another big increase after that. COVID and the university not being always in session. So we are looking at some fairly relatively steady numbers compared to many of our other counties, but still increases. Did I skip one? I did. Uh. Uh. Technology does not like me. Here we go. <laughs> so we also put in the slide on disabilities and ages. So we're looking at disability, any type, percent of the population. As we age, we're more likely to have disabilities and need additional assistance. And so it's important to remember that when we're talking about people with disabilities, we are not just talking about kids or young adults, that seniors are hit with mobility issues, with hearing difficulties. I mean, I've been wearing hearing aids since I was in my 40s. So, and I have a six at the front of my numbers now. So, um, self-care, the ability to take care of yourself, vision difficulties, and obviously just needing reading glasses is not what they consider to be vision difficulties. Uh, cognitive disabilities are very much the same. And it's important to note that years ago, if you had a child with um, Down syndrome or other um, cognitive issues, people often said, 
Your child's going to die by the time they reach early adulthood. It's not the case anymore. We have people with um, Down syndrome in our adult day center who are seniors. So people live longer. Um, and it's just important to understand that as we're progressing, our demographics are going to move up just like everybody else's in the state with the little caveat that we have more younger people around than many of the other counties. But um, we're trying to figure out what we can do as we're moving forward and how we're going to make this work. Um, it's not our goal to feed every senior citizen in Portage County. We can't afford to do that. Our goal is to feed the people who need us. We can't provide rides to everyone in Portage County. Our goal is to provide rides to those who need us. Um, but we are doing more of that out in the county than we ever used to do before. We are out in Rochelle, we are out in Allman, picking people up and giving them rides, which is something that did not really happen much before outside of medical rides. Um, do any of you have any questions on this? Uh, this will probably be more detailed than I can really get in, you know, I just want a more general idea. So it seems to me you're presenting us with the idea or the, the, the picture that we have a, a growing population that we're going to have to service in a variety of ways that the county services them. Do we have a budgetary response to that or is that kind of the point here that this is going to grow and you it's, as a department. It's kind of the point. <laughs> right, I just um, want to make sure we're on the same page. Right, I, I, I don't have answers to a lot of this. Um, I, I am, and with my board's position, do a lot of advocacy with the state. We are looking to get increases from the state for the nutrition program, from the state for the transportation program. Um, just an FYI, most of us outlive our driving years by 10 years. So when you can't drive or your spouse doesn't drive anymore and you live someplace where there's not bus service or a ride, we need to put money into transportation going down the road. But my, and by the way, I fully recognize that when I say I'm, I'm trying to to, I'm working very hard on the state to provide some of this money. I know full well that the state money is also taxpayer dollars. Um, no matter what, this is coming down to the taxpayer. And then we look at this and we know that there's fewer uh, people coming up behind us to help provide these services. Just to follow up, and this is, again, maybe at a uh, a discussion that I think we need to have as a board in the not too distant future is that on a day to day basis, it seems that we are not provided with the money to pay our bills. The state funding formula with the, uh, it's not revenue caps, but uh, levy caps, puts us in a difficult position that we've been in for nearly 20 years. And I don't know that we have a plan for that. And this is not a shot at you. Let's right. I, I'm like, this would be our plan. referred to uh, <laughs> right. Director and Josie. This is not my role. As a board, our plan can't be or shouldn't be, let's hope the state does this. Let's count on uh, the, the, uh, our department heads, our departments to figure this out. Because unless I'm wrong, that's what we've been doing for 20 years. And I don't think we can keep asking that of them forever. Right. So I don't know if that's the right place to begin this discussion, to push it forward to a different day. But, and I know that the priority is getting our capital improvements done, but we have to look at our day-to-day -day budget in the not too distant future, I think. Uh, I just softened it. Thanks. Supervisor Dodge. <laughs> I guess I think about it. I'm probably in the second range from the top. My husband is in the top range. Um, we are healthier than the elderly of years ago. Mm -hmm. We tend to 
eat better, we exercise. Um, so I think, you know, we're kind of looking at a very general picture here, but those people that have made it to that age are healthier than they ever were before. And I think we need to keep that in mind as well. You're not going to, you know, shovel them all off to assisted living or right. whatever. Statistically, very few of us end up in assisted living right. or a nursing home. It's just a fact. Most seniors age at home, which is where they prefer to age. Sure. Supervisor O'Honor, then Supervisor Gifford. Um, Cindy. You've mentioned nutrition services, transportation. Um, what what other challenges? I mean, staffing is going to be uh, it's going to have to be a huge issue as people need more care. Um, what are the other strains that you see coming in the next ten to fifteen, twenty years? So. <clears throat> You know, I mean, just in, in my little ADRC corner, there's things like health programming and adult day center, that sort of thing. But as a broader community, ambulance service, <laughs> um, hospital services, those are things that are going to be impacted. Home health services, how do we attract home health into our community to do more? Um, because people want to age at home, which is great, but some people do reach a point where, you know, they need someone to help them in their home. And it can be either chore-related or it can be medical-related. But we already have difficulty providing enough of those services here. So as there's more people, and again, the, the youngest baby boomers are 60 this year, which means that next year, we also start to have Gen X turn 60. You know, I'm serving, there are still people from the greatest generation who, you know, the, our World War II generation that we are serving. There's that silent generation, which is the biggest misnomer of all time because the silent generation, that's the uh, the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and the Grateful Dead. These are all <laughs> these guys are not boomers. They're older than that. Boomers listen to them. Then we have the boomers who are just. I mean, there's a ton of us, right? And then then you start having Gen X, and for some of our programs, we start at age 55. So we've been serving Gen X for four years. Um, I always like to say every living member of the Grateful Dead who is old enough to receive services can get them. <laughs> um, the other part of that that you know we don't always think about is why people need services. Our families have, have scattered. We have smaller families. Um, I'm very lucky, most of my kids live in the area, but not everybody's children do. Um, not everyone has kids. So who's gonna be those caregivers? Who's gonna be the person that brings them in and says, okay, let's talk about a chore provider list. You know, there's lots of things that are going on, but you know, truly that impact on the broader community in terms of things like, ambulance service and police service and um, medical is going to be um, just as profound as nutrition, probably more so, and more expensive. Thank you. Supervisor Gifford. Yeah, you know, I, I feel kind of fortunate to be on the two big committees that deal with the needs that you're talking about. We're the Transportation Coordinating uh, Committee I, I don't think a lot of people realize how many, when you talk about people who want to stay in their homes and, and remain you know, independent, uh, one of the needs that they may not be able to meet, again, because of the lack of driving as you get older, is their nutrition needs. And I think ADRC probably does uh, 
an award level <laughs> of uh, nutrition with Christy Cooley being at the helm of that mm -hmm. because the number of people who take volunteer trips way out to, you know, Alban and uh, Almond and Bancroft, that area, you know, to deliver home delivered meals is amazing. And, but on the other hand, the need for that kind of volunteer work is only going to grow and grow. So I think just as in the ADRC, that committee is always in hope of more funding from the state and often very disappointed by right. the lack of it. So, I mean, yeah, the, you're, you've got it all covered here. It's this. Well, and, and I'm not, this is, this truly came out of another presentation that was done and Joan very much felt I needed to bring this to all of you. Um, but my, my intent with this was not to say, give me more money. I mean, I think my budget's pretty modest. <laughs> Jenny may not agree with me, but I think it's pretty modest. Um, but, you know, we're, we are serving a whole lot of very different people, and we would never talk about 20-year-olds and 50-year-olds like they're in the same place in their life, right? But we talk about 60-year-olds and 90-year-olds that way all the time. And it's very different to be 60 than it is to be 90. And it's very different to be 20 than it is to be 50. And we have generalizations that we make about people as they age. So, uh, you know, I mentioned the Grateful Dead. I do want to remind all of you that the original drug culture came from people who are in their 70s. <laughs> so... We spend a lot of time talking about drugs and alcohol with on 14, 15, 16-year-olds. But we have a lot of 70-year-olds, so trust me, you can tell what they're doing in their car when they walk through my lobby, Sheriff's <laughs> Department. <laughs> Just saying. Um, you know, it's not, not the same world we think it is sometimes. But... Any other, uh, Supervisor Dodge? It just occurs to me that we're talking about financial support for the systems to support the elderly. But what about the social security system? Every one of these people in the 80 to 90 range are taking money out of a system that it was never built mm -hmm. to accommodate that. So you have funding issues at other levels as well relating to this because if if seniors aren't able to eat because they don't get enough money in their monthly check, that will be a real drain on the system. Any other questions? Cindy, thank you very much. Public notice, members of the public who wish to address the county board on specific agenda items must register their request at this time with such comments subject to the public comment ordinance and the reasonable control of the county board chair as set forth in Robert's Rules of Order. Do we have some? No. no. All right, moving on. Uh, review approval, number six. Approval of the August 2024 minutes. Take a motion. Motion by Splinter, second by Rockman. Any, all those in favor, uh, excuse me. <laughs> Any corrections or additions? Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Minutes passed. Number seven, approval of the August 21st, 2024 minutes. Motion by uh, Dubeck, second by Shabilsky, sorry. <laughs> Any additions or corrections? Discussion? 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? <laughs> Finally, approval of the September 4th, 2024 minutes. Motion by Medin. Second by Ware. Any additions or corrections? Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Minutes pass. Resolutions and ordinances. Resolution approving and adopting Halliday Properties LLC's requested Town of Plover Comprehensive Plan Amendments and Portage County Zoning Ordinance Map Amendment. Before I call for a motion on this, um, Director Josie would like to speak to this item a little bit before, oh, my apologies. Okay, motion by uh, Marissi, second by Barry Joukowsky. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Number 10, approving and authorizing a professional service agreement with Mergent Incorporated for wetland and stream mitigation bank maintenance and monitoring services. Motion by Schwartz, seconded by Laddock. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Number 11, approving and authorizing an amended agreement with J.J. Findorf and Sons Incorporated for a construction manager at risk services for the Ruth Guilfrey facility and repair and remodel project. Now, Director Josie would like to speak to this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, on your agenda tonight, there's a series of resolutions all related to the Guilfrey remodel repair and remodel project. So I just wanted to point out that they all kind of go together, but they're for different purposes. The first one you're gonna to address tonight is for the uh, construction component of the project um, to award um, the, the contract uh, amount to Findorf for the um, guaranteed maximum price of the services that includes both um, the different trades as well as any contingencies for the project. Um, there also is a component that you'll address uh, next that has to do with um, making a portion of the project state and local fiscal recovery funded. There is as well a general obligations issue for the project to cover the entirety of the project. And then finally, a budget amendment. Um, with the budget amendment resolution, we broke the overall project into really three components. One was for the initial flood mitigation work. One is for the lease cost for the um, temporary relocation of the, the services. And then the final is the overall construction. Um, under this agenda item that you're on currently um, to approve the contract with, or the amendment to the contract with Findorf, that covers just a construction component piece of the overall project. So it's a piece of the total project. Um, it's not the entirety of the project. So I just want to point that out. And I'm happy to, as we go through these tonight, answer any questions that you have on the project as we go through um, so that you have those questions answered. Thank you, Director Josie. Take a motion to get on the floor. Motion by Dubeck, seconded by Olke. Discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes. I need to make a clerical correction here. On item number nine, um, if there's no objection, I would like to suggest a technical amendment to change the adoption date of that resolution. The original date was August 20th. I would like to change that to August or to September 17th. Number 12, authorizing state and local fiscal recovery funds program SLR, SLF RRF projects. Take a motion to get it on the floor. Motion by Olke, seconded by Marissi. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes. 
Number 12, resolution awarding the sale of 13,190,000 general obligation promissory notes, series 2024A. Uh, I'd like to have Kristen speak to this if she's online. Yes, and just to introduce Kristen, she will have a presentation on the notes. Um, this includes both the Guilfrey project as well as highway projects. Um, it's a combined issuance. The reason for that is by putting them together, we saved on financing costs overall. Um, and Kristen can explain um, the information re regarding the sale. We did publish the revised final resolution. Um, because that is the, the, the original one that was in your packet was draft. The sale occurred at 10 a.m. this morning. And Kristen's here to share the, the great presentation that she has for you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. So can I ask somebody to move the slides for me, please? So yes. slide two. So Back in the early part of 2024, the board took action and adopted initial resolutions for both the um, transportation projects as well as um, the repair and renovation of the county's existing health and human services building. That was, Both resolutions were adopted on January 16th of 2024, and they both passed with the required three quarters vote. Next slide, please. And so just so you know, when we size debt issues, there's fees that get included. And Jenny mentioned we had combined the issues, but initially we had the two resolutions. You can see I was structuring these back in December of 2023. Um, and so it was based on kind of the most conservative costs before bids came in and things like that. But you can see our fee, estimated fees for bond council and disclosure council, bond rating, posting of the official statement. And then we always include a not to exceed number of underwriters discount. Um, this is, depending on when bids come in, this number can be less, but it can't be more than that 1%. And then we include what's called the rounding amount because Bonds and notes have to be issued in increments of 5,000. So this was kind of setting the stage at the end of 2023, beginning of 2024. So we put together a financing timeline based on kind of timing it before there's the election in November, just because as you get closer to that, the market becomes a little bit more volatile just because there's a lot of unknowns. Um, but also wanting to make sure that we were using the best project numbers um, to size any debt issue. So on September 9th, we had a call yes. with S&P Global Ratings. Oh, next slide, please. And so these calls typically last about an hour. The rating analysts review the offering document, which is the disclosure document that goes out to the financial community so they know what they're bidding on. They also take a look at other things, your policies, they look at your audited financials, and they ask a lot of good questions. They're kind of paying attention. There's like three, it's, like three, it's a three page questionnaire that you know Jenny had to walk through with them. And so basically they reaffirmed your AA rating and on the same day we had the rating call, they released new criteria. So the new rating is based on the new criteria where they put more weighting on your long-term liabilities, which includes both your outstanding debt as well as kind of any kind of pension, no PEB liabilities that you might have. And they put less weighting on the economy. So this is kind of beneficial for where the county is sitting right now. But some of the things that they highlighted is that you have a recent trend of positive operations, low debt, robust reserves, a strong tax base. Um, talk about your positive operations and the well-funded plan as a participant in WRS. Um, municipal issues and county issuers in Wisconsin get that because of the state pension program. They highlight the rapid amortization of debt. This is how quickly you pay off your debt. 
We talk about budget surpluses over the last three years due to your conservative budgetary approach and anticipating the same will happen again in 2024. Um, higher than anticipated investment income and personnel vacancies, personnel vacancies. Um, talking about your economic growth pattern is exceeding or outpacing your neighboring counties. And you have a ta stable tax base and well diversified group of your ta top 10 taxpayers and they view your management policies and practices as a credit strength. So this is kind of kudos to you, the county and what you're doing um, to get the AA rating. I don't know, Jenny, did you want to add anything about this or not? No, we were very happy with the call. Okay. <laughs> Next slide, please. So then, as Jenny indicated, we actually combined the issue um, in order to save on some of the issuance expenses. So you can share them between can the kind of project costs. And so we're based on the combined issue and the project costs and use of some of the funds to apply toward the health and human services building. We estimated going to market with $11,575,000. This was actually on the offering document that went out to the underwriting community. And so then today we took bids. I mean, this is actually very exciting news. So page six, we took bids at 10 a.m. And... Next slide, please. Thank you. Oh, wow. You got nine bids. <laughs> and looking back historically in the last few years since 2019, you've been getting anywhere from three to six bids. So this morning when I came into work, I saw who all the bankers were that were signed up to bid. You had 10 bidders signed up, nine of them bid. and. We've been using an estimated interest rate since we started planning this back in December of 2023, and yeah. we didn't know kind of the size of you know what the size of the issue was going to be, how long the issue was going to be. We were estimating five percent. You can see that the best bidder was Piper Sandler out of Minneapolis with a two point eight two six seven, and because of the type of bid that you received we were able to reduce the size of the issue to the 11,455. You might recall that we went to market with 11,575. And so this will, you will not be over issuing for the project costs. It'll save on interest costs because we combined kind of the two projects into one borrowing, you saved on issuance costs. So this is pretty exciting news. I literally called Jenny at 10 o'clock when we knew the final bids. I said, I don't normally do this, but you got nine bids and this is what the interest rate is. So next slide, please. So just give a sense of kind of where you're at right now with your existing debt before this bond sale, you have two issues outstanding. As of the date of the sale, you have your 2023 A's and B's. Um, so basically for 2024, you just see interest only because you've already made the earlier payment in June, but you had, um, a total principal and interest on those two issues of just under 4.4 million. And then it drops down in 2026. We've been kind of doing this to plan for future borrowings, um, including kind of the discussions you're having about some of your other cap big capital, larger capital projects, as well as future borrowings for your highway projects, anticipating another borrowing in 2025 as well. So then next slide, slide eight shows the, now the three issues that will be outstanding. So it shows the two payments on the 2023 A's and B's, and then the new debt service schedule for the new 11,455 the debt goes out five years. You can see that the total principal and interest payment will be just around 5.8 million. You can see it drops um, in future years. So that way you can build in additional debt with less of an impact to your debt levy. 
And then because I'm a nerd in public finance and this, and people kind of ask kind of where's the market been? The next slide, slide nine, shows just the 10 year history of tax exempt and taxable rates right now. This is just a tax exempt issue. So it has lower rates than taxable, but the blue line does show the geo debt maturing in five years, similar to yours, what you just issued today for double A credits, similar to your credit. And so you can just see what's happened over the last 10 years and why we kind of don't really know where the market's gonna be at any point in time. So this is just kind of where things have been bringing us to today. And then the last slide shows just kind of the steps that have happened to bring us to the sale today, um, where we took bids and you have a resolution that um, Director Jossie had mentioned, prepared or updated by Quarles and Brady, your bond council populated with all of the sale results, the actual numbers, because when they um, distributed it earlier, there were blanks in it because we had not had the sale yet. And then kind of the last item that will need to take place is that you will get the proceeds for the notes to, for the very, the projects being funded by the original initial resolutions. So exciting news today for me, for you. Any questions? I just want to add for the board's knowledge, um, because of the um, project budget, which you'll address in the next agenda item, it's higher than the actual um, note sale today. We actually lessened the amount um, by about a million dollars to reduce it for the contingencies, knowing that we will have a note sale in 2025 for highway projects. Um, we can always increase that amount in 2025 for any contingencies that we run into for the projects. It's part of our project budget, but because of interest rates and arbitrage, we didn't want to borrow money that we would potentially have to pay taxes on if we did not spend it and we're stuck with unspent proceeds. So we actually lowered the amount and then based on the bid today, um, Kristen and her staff were able to resize and redo the schedule based on the new amount. And that's what resulted in the lower issuance as well as the change in the schedule. And the schedule is very much in tune with keeping the planned uh, principal and interest payments for 2025 around the target that we wanted so that we could plan for future debt. Thank you, Director Josie, and thank you, Kristen. <clears throat> Just a, a quick point of clarification. So the number of bids we got today, the interest rate we ended up with in our ranking with surrounding counties are all really good news for Portage County. And I'd like to thank Director Josie and her staff for positioning us in this position. Another point of clarification before we uh, open 13 up for a motion. Uh, the final resolution has been posted and provided via email to all supervisors. County Ordinance 3.1.487 allows an exemption to the 24 hour notice rule in this case. Uh, the resolution can also be found in your packet under the other category. I would take a motion to get this on the floor. Motion by Laddick, seconded by Dodge. Discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes. Item and I need four. to note, oh. Go ahead, Kristen. Thank you. I need to note the time because I need to let the winning underwriter know. So it passed at 549. Do you agree? Yep. Agreed. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you so much for your presentation, Kristen. You can <clears throat> All right. Thank you. 
Item number 14, authorizing the 2024 budget amendments and transfers. Take a motion. Motion by Shabilsky, seconded by Morrow. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes. I would take a motion to adjourn. Motion by Randazzo, seconded by Barry Joukowsky. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? We stand adjourned. Thank you. A video of this meeting is available for viewing on the city's website, stevenspoint.com videos.